Coming up on DTNS, YouTube clamps down on some music monetization. Amazon's choice continues to confuse. And how are digital cameras going to survive the smartphone age? This is the Daily Tech Friday, the 16th of 2019 from Studio P Lion. I'm Sarah Lane. It's Art Prov Friday. I'm Len Peralta. And uh, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We are also lucky enough to be joined by Ant Pruitt, new host at twit.tv. We didn't have that title for you last time you were on the show. Ant, welcome. Hey, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah, things have changed just slightly, right? That's great, <laughs> though. It's great. Congratulations. Uh, and Thank thanks you. for joining us on this Friday, because I know you got, you got a big road trip to take pretty soon. Yeah, just a little bit of a road trip. It's only about 2,700 miles, I think. It's just oh, that's nothing. Bit. Yeah, you just drive, just do a straight shot. You know, <laughs> don't even need to rest. Uh, well, uh, yeah, nice pack show today. Len is going to be illustrating throughout the show. We'll check with him at the end of the show to see what he has drawn us. It's always fantastic, so I look forward to that. And also, before the show, if you aren't a patron yet, patreon.com slash DTNS is where you can go to get our extended show, Good Day Internet. We were talking about cigars and teacher behavior and <laughs> you know roger was complaining about something it was a good time so <laughs> patreon.com slash dtns for the wider conversation but now let's start with a few tech things you should know the bluetooth sig issued a security notice about key negotiation of bluetooth also known as a knob attack which inter interferes with Bluetooth pairing procedures, shortens the connection's encryption key, and then allows easier brute force techniques to spy on data transfer between devices. Affected devices use Bluetooth BR, EDR, that's also known as Bluetooth Classic, and knob only works if both connecting devices have the vulnerability. Apple and Microsoft have already rolled out patches, and the Bluetooth core specification now requires a minimum encryption key length. Research firm Canalys's latest report shows wearables priced between $200 and $299, or $300 to $399, now represent 80% of all shipments, 60% of all shipments, rather. In Q2 of 2019, over 60% of the 4.7 million global Apple Watch shipments went to North America. That's a 32% bump over the 2018 quarter. And over in, in shipments, uh, besides Apple Watch, Fitbit was in second place with 1.9 million shipments. Samsung, Garmin, and Fossil made up the rest of the top five, although none of them beat the others category, which shipped 1.3 million units. Those are global units. On September 17th and 18th, the European Union's General Court will hear challenges from Apple and Ireland in a three-year-old 13 billion euro tax bill battle. In August of 2016, the European Commission ruled that Apple had unfair advantages and ordered Ireland to recoup that tax sum plus interest. The Irish government has said it profoundly disagrees with the EU's decision. Let's talk a little more about Apple and lawsuits, something that Apple knows quite well. Uh, so in other Apple lawsuit news today, the company filed one against a mobile device virtualization company, Corellium, which describes itself as the first and only platform that offers not only iOS, but also Android and Linux virtualization on ARM. In the Southern District of Florida, where the lawsuit was filed, Apple accused Corellium of copyright infringement for illegally replicating iOS, as well as some iPhone and iPad apps. Apple argues that Corellium posed its virtualization product just as a research tool to help discover security vulnerabilities, but that, quote, Corellium has simply copied everything, the code, the graphical user interface, the icons, all of it in exacting detail. And it seems that Apple has a pretty solid argument here. Uh, is Corellium something that you would never consider using? You ever do any development? If I were into development, I would, because I, I, I see a place for something like this. But for Apple to say that they flat out copied it, now I'm wondering, well, who's the source? How did they get this? Because you can emulate a lot of different things in code, but not necessarily line for line the way um, the original source code, source code may be. So I think that's some pretty, pretty bold statements from uh, the Apple council there. Yeah, well, I mean, for for Apple to have done this, they probably have significant evidence, at least to argue, listen, that the Corellium has gone too far here. This is something that they would have had to get permission from. You know, you, you can't right. just you just rip off something that, that we've put together without consulting us at all. Apple's the only company, at least at this point, uh, that's accusing Corellium of this. But um, mm -hmm. I could see other companies jumping on board, potentially, 
I mean, it, you know, it's it's Apple's also a huge company with a lot of legal weight behind it. So oh yeah, right. So yeah, I mean, it's 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 interesting. And Roger and I were talking before the show that you know, there are a lot of really great reasons that virtualization tools exist. Right. Um, there, you, know, you can you can you can right. test test <laughs> app development. You can you can look for security flaws. This doesn't necessarily mean that this is not a legitimate product. However. You know, when you when you cross Apple, you 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 tend to get in hot water I mean, pretty quickly. In, in many respects, Apple will probably win this case if they can prove that uh, the company Corellium Corel did indeed it didn't even have to steal the whole thing, right? They just need to you know have been proved to to, to lifted some of it. Mm -hmm. I think the the bigger question is like there there is a market for tools like this. Would it be in Apple's interest to rather cooperate and just make a deal with Corellium? Instead of just trying to sue everything they think is uh, out of, because because they Apple has a tendency to 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 look very poorly on companies that they don't directly control. Or exactly. Anything. And so right. it, it it might not be so much of like you're stealing money from us, but you're not in our orbit, so <laughs> we don't like it, and you're 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 profiting right. from one of our IPs. You've done it done it too well apple literally called corellian's uh, virtualization exacting detail almost a compliment really. i mean and if they did it from a clean room you know what they got some great coders and you they should they could be hired out as uh, os developers there you well, go the next aqua hire on the on the table is that what you're saying <laughs> uh no comment well, it, that's the case. We will revisit it on a future DTNS. Uh, but speaking of copyright, another copyright story today, YouTube announced that copyright owners will no longer be able to monetize creator videos that include short, very short, or unintentional uses of copyrighted music using YouTube's manual claiming tool. They'll now be able to choose either to try to prevent the other party from monetizing the video themselves or try to block the content. YouTube said in a blog post that aggressive manual claiming of short music clips, quote, can feel particularly unfair as they transfer all revenue from the creator to the claimant, regardless of the amount of music claimed. However, the majority of claims are currently created through YouTube's content ID match system. Anybody who uses YouTube is probably familiar with that, not the manual claiming tool. So this is a minority of folks who are going to be affected. But yeah, it does sound like this was a tool that was that was being exploited, perhaps unfairly. And I, I, I assume you know your way around YouTube. Is this something you ever come across? I've been flagged a time or two, and it's usually in air, but... I like this idea here because it's not necessarily allowing the other folks to capitalize on all of the creators work. Mm -hmm. um, but, but this system, it's, it's getting, it's getting better. It's still not great, but it's nice to see that YouTube and Google are trying to, you know, make this a little bit better for the creator side, because that's what, it, what it's all about. It's about the creators. Yeah. It, I, uh, if you, if you, as an example, if I'm out and about in the world and I, I see Ant on the street and I, I decide to interview him and, you know, a car rolls by and the windows are down and there's a song being played and there's nothing I could have done about that. You know, that's right. let's say that that video goes really viral and we get 10 million views yep. or somebody saying, well, that song that I that was my song playing in that car for mm -hmm. two seconds that you heard. Now, I want all of the money that does seem uh potentially very unfair. So that content creator still, it's not that they have had all of their rights stripped. They have the right to say, okay, well, this isn't going to work. You know, I, I, I don't want Sarah to be making money off of that uh, video or that video should be blocked entirely for whatever reason that they might come up with, but not just that my money now gets transferred to that other person. You know, I, I can see an argument if we're say at a concert or what have you, and you have all these A-list people there and they want to give you an interview just for the heck of it, just because they're, everybody's having a good time and the music's playing in the background. I, I could see it there because that is an event with an artist that's, you know, they're paid from, from their work there. But now, just like if you said out in public somewhere, just going down the street, you know, I think that's pretty asinine that those claims come in. In, uh, in news over on the East Coast, a federal judge issued a 153-page ruling ordering Georgia officials to stop using the state's current electronic voting machines by the end of the year. That's after municipal elections that are being held in November. Currently, uh, Georgia uses the Diebold AccuVote TSX touchscreen machine. If you're not familiar with it, security research found it to have numerous security vulnerabilities dating back to 2006. There isn't enough evidence, at least according to the researchers, that Georgia ever updated the systems. 
And Georgia has somewhat of a notorious past with with security issues regarding elections and voting. Georgia hopes, it says, to have new ballot marking machines time in place for a presidential primary election, which is happening in March of 2020. However, if it can't meet that deadline, and that is likely, the state will be required to use paper ballots. Going back to paper, Ant. I mean, it's it's one of the safer ways to do it, I suppose. It just works. Paper just works. You, you, you get your little black ink and you fill it in and the scanner does the rest. It just works. This stuff should should have been handled a long time ago because this isn't the first time we've heard about these machines being vulnerable to attack. Uh, and there's been several demonstrations of just how quickly they can be attacked and, and overtaken. You would think the different jurisdictions around the country would have taken heed to that and said, you know what, we need to do something about this because we really don't want to screw up our democratic government any more than it already is. Yeah, the Ars Technica article um, that that kind of laid out many of the issues that the state has had over the last decade plus um, in detail is really great. Uh, you know, a lot of it has to do with, it's not just, oh, these voting machines that you can press to, you know, choose your candidate. They're really, you know, made poorly. It has also has to do with the fact that data is being transferred from a computer at a government organization and that computer might be compromised as well. And then there's some sort of a, 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 a disk that 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 get that's transferring malware from it to the voting machine. There, there are way too many points of failure where data can either be corrupted, altered, or go missing, as in the, recent, in, the, in, in the recent Georgia case where they wanted they wanted the state to cough up the, the actual re- election data from from the voting, and it just happened to mysteriously disappear, or quote unquote accidentally erased. The problem is there's no there's there's no baseline standard of what's considered an acceptable electronic voting machine. Is it one that also spits out a paper ballot so you can go back and then audit the votes, saying like, here's my receipt, this is how I voted. Does the electronic vote match what I you know on this paper? There's no there's no way to kind of audit the entire system to ensure that there is an integrity to it. And you know, no one has no one says like, okay, this is this is how they should all work. Everyone, every state, every state election uh, board can decide what constitutes uh, an acceptable you know acceptable system. One would think there'd be plenty of tax dollars to help fund stuff like this to, just to get it right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it, it would be. And, you <laughs> Those know, tax dollars always seem to go to other things. And you know, and you know, it, it's 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 one of those things that I think it becomes more important as elections become decided by sm- shorter and sh- or not smaller and smaller margins, where right. mm-hmm. they go mm-hmm. back and they do recounts to see, okay, uh, candidate A won over candidate B, and we have you know a proof because if. If you remove the the faith that the population has in the way the votes count and the way the votes uh, are tallied, then you have a problem because then that's when democracy starts breaking down. Well, might be paper ballots for Georgia in March. Uh, we will see in just a few short months. Uh, get on it, state. Let's see if you can do it. Amazon's recommended items label that it calls Amazon's Choice has drawn many questions about how those products get awarded such a distinction. A pitch deck reviewed by Digiday, which it claims is real, details a 2017 bidding program for the Amazon's Choice badge, essentially offering vendors the ability to bid for the badge by lowering their prices, maybe spending more money on advertising, making it attractive to Amazon and the vendor both. This would give the vendor better placement in search results, which, as we all know, is very important when Amazon is 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 your marketplace. In response, Amazon tells Digiday the program was never offered, but didn't really elaborate. The source tells uh, Digiday that the bidding program did actually run briefly in 2017, but Amazon then rolled it back, and Amazon's choice badges are now driven by algorithms. The company does claim that it awards product listings that have high in-stock and conversion rates, high customer ratings, competitive prices, and prime shipping. The algorithm sounds like, okay, something that is, is, is created, it's an editor's choice that's created by an algorithm, probably makes sense for Amazon because you got a lot of products to deal with. And I don't know if you've ever bought something that was labeled Amazon's choice that didn't end up seeming like a very great product, but I have. Sadly, I have too. <laughs> yeah. So whether or not this program uh, ran where where companies could, could, could try to bid to be Amazon's choice vendors, which 
you know, some people are kind of going to go, well, I mean, you bid. And if Amazon doesn't agree, it doesn't mean that you technically get it. But if we're talking like, hey, spend a little bit more money, get a little bit higher placement, then it, it seems a little bit like a pay for play type model. And so it's still it, a business. <laughs> exactly. Even assume, assuming that this never happened, which Amazon says it, it did not. It does appear that that was something that that might have been thrown around in a uh, in a conference room at some point. Do you think, though, that for a company like Amazon to be awarding labels based on an algorithm, which algorithms often work quite well, but not all the time, um, to the point where people like you and me are getting products sometimes where we're like, this is junk. Why is this happening? You know, is, 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 is this the best way to go about it? I'm I much rather trust the algorithm from Amazon versus this whole pay for play thing. Um, because Amazon is not the only company potentially guilty of this. There are, uh, you can look up camera of the year, for example, mm -hmm. and you'll find six or seven different models of, of camera of the year. And sometimes from the same uh, a, a company that's touting camera of the year. And it's all because of how many times they got their pockets filled up with, hey, make mine the best, you know, right. give me an algorithm. Amazon already does a really good job with algorithms for, for the most part anyway. Just keep it that way. Yeah, the high customer ratings is always the thing where I go uh, because I just I'm so I'm so hyper aware of how easily that can be gamed on lots of platforms. Amazon is certainly one that has seen a lot of that. Um, I I don't even bother to try to like decipher if I think a bot wrote the five star reviews the, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. that take up the top twenty reviews on any product I look at because mm -hmm. it's just so pervasive. Right. But yeah, I agree with you that that. An algorithm again. It, it's what, what if you if you're going to do something that's editor's choice. What other option would Amazon really have besides just not having that badge at all? Right. Right. In a press release announcing a new Disney and Charter Communications distribution deal for Hulu, ESPN Plus, and Disney Plus, the two companies have agreed to work together on piracy mitigation, including implementing business rules and techniques to address such issues as unauthorized access and password sharing. Dun, dun, dun. No details about how those measures would be implemented were mentioned. Ars Technica notes that Charter CEO Tom Rutledge has complained about account sharing before, criticizing TV networks for not locking down content well enough, and that password sharing leads to lower numbers of cable TV subscribers. All right. Well, none of us do things like this. But if we did, hypothetically... Uh, <laughs> It sounds as though uh, uh, you know Dis Disney's is worried. Uh, Disney's worried that it it and it has probably seen enough evidence that if I have a subscription and I share my password with you, and then maybe I'm keeping you from giving the money that that it uh, the the company feels is rightfully theirs of you having your own subscription. But be, how how does it get enforced? That that could be really really hard to track down with when if people are savvy enough to, to think about that, because you have VPN usage and people figuring out ways to block Mac addresses, and then you have people that are turning off location and things of that nature. Uh, it, the people that are already pirating this stuff, they're pretty clever. So uh, I think ESPN and Disney and all of those folks are just gearing themselves up for a game of whack-a-mole. And, you know, and it's weird because Netflix has the same issue, but they honestly don't really care because ultimately more eyeballs mean more eyeballs and that at some point those people eventually turn into customers. They do sign up for the cheapest yeah. package. Right, and, right. and some money is better than no money. The other thing is the simplest way is just, you know, to, to block it is to have a system where if someone's watching your Disney plus whatever Hulu plus stream, you don't allow a second one, right? Someone mm -hmm. signs in with Roger Chang and he's watching. No one else can sign in until I'm done watching. And it's not like they charge you on the amount you watch, right? You right. pay the 16 bucks. It's for the month. Didn't say right. you can only watch seven hours a day, 17 hours a day, or, or 24 hours a day. So if I'm done and no one else is using it, why not let someone else watch? Yeah, if you've got if you've got a big enough household where you might have somebody watching something else in the other room, there might be concurrent streams that could be happening within Limited the same IP three. address. It, you know, yeah. it's... it's Limit to three, you won't have to worry about geographic, you know, herding. Like, oh, right. you can only watch in the Bay Area or you can only watch, 
you know, in and around Denver, or you can only which is what YouTube yeah. TV does fairly well because I've tested yeah. the system. <laughs> Can't have a family member in Arizona. Whoops. But um, but I, I, my mom and I actually ran into this not with Charter. She has Direct TV that she uses for her TV service, and she lives on the other side of California from me. And a couple times when she visited, we just logged into her Direct TV account from my Apple TV app, and right. we were like, "Great, this is awesome," you know, because I don't have cable. And the last couple of times we had all these issues and she finally got on the phone with them because we thought, I don't know, there's just some tech thing going on. Like we're not getting the username right or something's going on. Right. And they said, no, 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 you can't do that. You have to be within your own Wi-Fi network. And she was like, well, then what's the use? <laughs> you know, like I'm paying for this and it's a pretty penny. It's over a hundred bucks a month. Right. And I can't travel and like watch TV in my iPad. And they were like, no. And obviously the company did that for this exact same reason that they're like, you, you we rather restrict your own account to make sure that you're not going to just share that password with Sarah when you're not visiting. Anyway, yeah, the piracy war wages on. We will prevail. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. So, Anne, I'm really excited that you're on the show today because... We're going to talk about digital cameras or perhaps the fall of digital cameras, which has been happening for a while. Digital camera market declined about 80% to 19 million unit sales in 2018 versus more than $400 million in smartphone sales sold globally in the same year. If you look at Japan specifically, which has historically had a very uh, robust digital camera market, right. uh, eight digital camera makers of eight digital camera makers, only Sony, only Sony saw profit growth in the most recent annual period. And that was largely not from digital camera sales, but the sensors that Samsung has been right. making for smartphones that's helping it do quite well. Uh, digital cam companies have had to evolve. And if you look at some of the others, Nikon, now gets over half of its business from selling to other companies, not consumers. Fujifilm has, has been playing around with somewhat novelty and kind of nostalgia at hybrid cameras. Um, they've mm. got one um, called the Instax Mini Lee Play hybrid camera. So it's digital images, but it also is kind of a Polaroid style mm -hmm. printout image kind of thing. Uh, Taylor Swift did a limited release of a, a similar model last year and sold 10 million units, which is... <laughs> <laughs> a big part of the entire global market of 2018. Uh, Fuji Film is now selling black and white film again after discontinuing it last year. Mm -hmm. And Canon still has, if you look at Japan again, over 60% of the share, um, or just under 60% of the share of DSLRs. But again, putting a lot of R&D money into video, AK video, uh, cameras that are highly compatible with 5G networks. The future, the future beyond. So when you when you look at the digital camera market and and where these huge companies who were at the top of the game have 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 begun to shift and have 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 really been struggling to 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 actually be profitable anymore in in this market where do you see it going i think it's a couple of things and it sort of reminds me of the iphone and the and the troubles that they they that they used to have far as getting more sales people didn't need to buy them as often because they just worked. And now you're talking about a physical DSLR that's not as easy to carry around as a camera. They're gonna look back at the camera that they have and say, you know what, this is just good enough. It's doing everything that I need. I don't necessarily need to up, update, upgrade or what have you. Um, but there's still always that niche, you know, where, where Canon can eventually come around and make their mirrorless side of it a little more, more fascinating for consumers other than professionals. And that could boost sales. They've tried it with this EOS RP. The big time professionals hate that camera, but that camera's not for them. And Canon gets that, you know, Canon's taking a lot of heat, but they understand that that camera is gonna reach more for those folks carrying the smartphone around that says, man, I really wish I had a real camera with me today so I can take this shot. There are so many times that I've been approached on social media uh, with people saying, you know what, I should probably go buy a real camera instead of using my phone. Because every now and then, regular Joes, if you will, they just like to take nice standard shots outside or wherever they are. That's not all blurry from the smartphone. Mm -hmm. Yes, smartphone cameras are great. They are really, really good. 
but sometimes you can really capture that memory with a nice larger crop sensor and store it somewhere, get it printed without it having any type of pixelation or anything like that. It's, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting, um, market because if you want to if, if you want to see what's happening i'm going to pull up this chart of basically where the the graph of where the market is it's the digital camera market is actually dropping back to where it was before digital cameras were were a thing and a lot of that has to do with smartphone now it's not just image quality it's the fact that it's connected right want to get that pic of me and grandma at the grand canyon on facebook Yep. How am I going to do that from a DSLR? I got to you know load it in on my computer and then send it out that way, or have a, some sort of wireless connection. Convenience factor on smartphones is tremendous, as is the ability to quickly add whatever you want, you know, onto your social media networks. And that's mm-hmm. kind of been the conundrum for a lot of these companies. You know, Canon, Nikon, Sony have all implemented some sort of feature to upload, if not directly, just faster getting those photos off yep, and, camera. and and you know part of it is cameras have been engineered from uh from a very camera centric point of view i mean a, f- a photographer point of view in other words it was designed for a very prosumer enthusiast professional mindset a lot of people right. just want to take pictures by pressing a button not worry about aperture shutter speed Mm-hmm. how well I'm holding the picture. They just want it, it done for them, which is why so many smartphone companies have been implementing some sort of post-processing feature because although the sensors are smaller, you can do so much more with the smartphone and post-processing after the fact. Um, mm-hmm. Where I see the market going is that there has to be some of these companies that fall out or switch over entirely to a different product, whether it's uh, software only or if it's lenses or if it's some sort of hybrid. Canon, Sony, are and 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 Panasonic have been, you know, been pretty well known for implementing video, video camera features in their DSLRs and their mirror camera lenses. And having a hybrid is great because then people kill two birds with one stone. They can take advantage of the same awesome lens set that they use for still photos and use it for video. At the same time, they don't feel like they're just blowing money and it's just sitting on the shelf gathering dust until they go to Aruba or Hawaii for their annual vacation. Um, The other factor (laughs) is, a lot of creators are getting in on on that. They realize that shooting their weekly vlog or whatever on their smartphone, handy, but doesn't look as great, especially with the field of credit as it is. And so a lot of them are moving to uh, video DSLR. Shannon uh, does a lot of her work on her uh, um, Sony Alpha video uh, um, mirrorless interchangeable lens camera. I hate that name. It's, it's so complicated for a uh, category. But... <laughs> They really had to think out of the box, right? It's like when German automobile makers were having a really tough time trying to come up with an electric car, and then here comes along Elon Musk and pumps one out, first a Roadster, then a, then a performance sedan and an SUV, because they have been coming from the engineer's mindset. And so right. they, they're kind of in a, in, a, in a walled garden where they can't see outside of the box and that's kind of where they need to be and i don't see that and i ex- actually expect to see more bloodletting um as a lot of these consumer markets that they used to rely on uh to make so much of their money is just diminishing because people it's like you know what you know the old photographer adage is the best camera to have is the one that's on you all the time which is mm-hmm. tends to be your smartphone i still think that these manufacturers can play the long game and 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 do what Canon is doing with that EOS RP. I have it back there. I have a, re- a review unit and I'll say firsthand, it's not the best camera. It's it's not, but I could put my hat on as if I'm like my great uncle or someone that loves to take photos and replace that camera um, that he's currently using. I think he uses like an old rebel or something. He would love this camera. I mean, it, it would blow, it would blow him away. It would give him a little more detail. It would give him a few more features and specs and so forth. And he would keep that for years. You know, if if they could marry the functionality of a smartphone that you just dock with a lens and a sensor, you leave all the intelligence to the phone, the phone can process it, the oh, phone man, can yeah. send it to your, your parents, it can send it to Facebook, send it to Twitter for you. I think that would make a lot of sense because, you know, a lot of, you know, any photographer knows more than half of what you pay for a camera is in the glass, the lenses, right? That's it. Lens. Lens. <laughs> and then, you know, the sensors get upgraded. It's great. You can ditch the body, get a new one. But, you know, if you can marry those two, and they've tried with 
not so much great success because they've always ended kind of in time. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's that's the ultimate marriage is that they can marry that to a smartphone without feeling that they need to do all of it, right? We need to have this firmware. We need to have the sensor. We have the wireless. We need, we need all of it in the complete package, and it's just an accessory like everything else. Yeah, I can tell you uh, I have a Canon EOS R, the, the grown-up mm-hmm. version of the RP, and I've been using it for a while now, and between this and my ADD, anytime I go out to a sporting event for my kids or whatever else, everybody wants to take pictures with their phones, but as soon as the game is over, they're all coming to me asking if they can get a copy of my pictures. Looking at you. Convenience is there, but the fidelity is still resides in these. And I think that's where the, you're right. We went for for a period where everybody wanted a digital camera because they were just great and you could do so much. But now it's getting to be where everybody has a, an okay camera in their pocket. But when it comes down to the fidelity and just the features and, and the pictures you can get, especially action shots, the i think i really think the slr the dslr are are here to stay they just may become more niche and that's fine with me i'm as a camera enthusiast i'm fine with that there are some people that still want to print photographs to put on the wall and in their homes i'm a person who wants to do that so (laughs) nine times out of ten they're going to look to me or look for for amos what what do you grab because i i want to put this up as a memory in the in the, the game room or something you know Well, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. You can submit stories. Maybe they're about digital cameras. Maybe they're about something else. And vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We will not make you use paper ballots. We're also on Facebook, facebook.com slash groups slash daily tech news show. All right, let's check in with Len Peralta, who has been drawing up a storm this entire show. Len, what do you got for us today? Well, you know, I uh, have just had this problem with digital cameras this week. Uh, I visited the Jim Henson exhibit (laughs) and I wanted to take really great pictures, but I also wanted to share them immediately. Uh, And uh, this is my take on the, uh, the, the, not, I don't want to say it's a death of the digital camera market, but let's just, you did uh, use a gravestone and all. I did (laughs) it's a gravestone and it's a, it's a, a millennial in front of it posing as a selfie. Um, The duck lips. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) She's done it all. And the bikini. Yeah, that, there yeah. you go. So, uh, so yeah, so if you are interested in this image, uh, this is available on my Patreon. Right now, if you're a Patreon subscriber, patreon.com forward slash Len or at my online store, lenperaldestore.com. Very cool. Thank you, Len. And by the way, uh, the last person to speak on our wonderful digital camera discussion was Amos, who I didn't introduce at the beginning of the show, but I'm glad you jumped in, Amos. Mm-hmm. Also, thanks to Ant Pruitt for being with us today. Ant, where can folks keep up with all of your fabulous work, digital camera and otherwise? Uh, check me out over on Instagram at Ant underscore Pruitt. Very cool. You know who gets the DTNS choice label? It's real. Yes, it's not chosen from an algorithm or anything. Our patrons, you can become a DTNS member and get ad-free RSS feeds, extra content each week, bonus episodes of the show, and a lot more. Sign up at patreon.com slash DTNS. If you've got feedback for us, we'd love to hear it. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we'll see everyone on Monday. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Frog Pants Network. Get more shows like this at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>